Hello, welcome to Revenant Reads. I'm Ben, and this is another edition of Fresh Red Kills. So Fresh Red Kills is a series of videos where I talk about books that I have recently finished reading. I'm going to be talking about some nonfiction books that I read for Historathon 2024, and they all deal with the ancient Near East, at least for the most part. Um, so let's begin with this one. This is the first one that I read. Uh, this is The Babylonians. So for Historathon 2024, which is a year-long reading event where we read, discuss, and celebrate nonfiction history, and we divide the year up into four quarters. The first quarter uh, is uh, looking at the time period from prehistory to the year 500 CE. And one of the things I wanted to focus on for this quarter this year was the ancient Near East and also ancient Rome. So um, really January is the Near East, and then the rest of the quarter will be Rome. And I started with this. So I had found this actually, I think at the local Goodwill, um, and I was really happy to find it. One of my other co-hosts for uh, Storathon 2024, Bill Rutenberg, I'm pretty sure that he read this last year for quarter one. And I think that he thought it was okay, uh, if I remember correctly. And that's kind of how I describe this. So it's The Babylonians, An Introduction by Gwendolyn Leake. I'm not sure if I'm saying that right. And it really is that, it is an introduction. It's only about 150 pages. And um, she divides this up into a few sections here. So she's got setting the scene, which is almost like an introduction. Um, we've got the history, society and economy, religion and material culture. And it's, it's an interesting way to, um, to basically organize this. I don't know if I loved the way that that's organized um, because Babylon was so long-lived. I mean, we're talking thousands of years, and it went through various eras. And she talks about the various eras inside the history section. But then, it, you know, material culture is going to change over time, and society is going to change over time. I almost kind of wish that it was broken up into those different eras. Um, but anyhow, this still works. And I'm sure that she knows better than me <laughs> as far as how to organize this. So she has the history section, and I will say it is very... It is very rapid fire. I mean, it's like you're being, you're, you're having uh, facts thrown at you and you're just trying to catch them and, you know, keep them in your head as quickly as possible. Uh, so it doesn't make for compulsive reading and it's a lot to take in. Um, so I found the beginning kind of, you know, honestly dry. Uh, but then she starts getting into more. Um, science, society and economy is kind of interesting. And then at the end we get to religion and then material culture. And that's where we're starting to get into the social history. And that's where I started getting really drawn in, um, into the way that they organized their, organized their houses, uh, their, how their society was, um, you know, was basically stratified. Um, there's some, yeah, we get into even like their sexuality, uh, their death and the afterlife, um, there, some of their various rituals as well. Um, and you do also have some images that go along the way. So the thing is like, you know, just as I was starting to get drawn in and like really into it, the book is over. Uh, so you kind of have to, you have to slog through a lot of historical information just kind of being tossed at you um, in the beginning before you get to the end. So it kind of left me, you know, with a, a middling, a middling feeling, a middling opinion. I felt like I sort of, got a feeling for the Babylonians, but it was barely, barely a taste. But again, this is an introduction. And this is how I would recommend it. I think that if you're going to use it as an introduction to the Babylonians and then go on to something else, I think it actually does work pretty well. Because what I ended up reading was this afterwards. So we got Irving Finkel, The First Ghosts, Most Ancient of Legacies, uh, where he deals with Babylon. Now, he gives us a little bit of background here and there, but not the way this does. Um, so this actually really did help me, pre this helped prepare me for this book. Um, so I'm really glad I read it. Like if I just read this and that was it, I would kind of have, I think a lower opinion of it. Um, but the fact that I realized how much this helped me to properly approach this book, I actually, you know, th this book went higher up in value for me. Um, for instance, you know, it, it's Irving Finkel talks about things like, uh, the way that a house is organized, um, and burial, which she also touched on, but she also touches on like how long a house would last, how often it would be rebuilt, which he doesn't necessarily touch on. So it gives you certain context. He'll talk about different rulers in here, but 
because I had that rapid fire section of the history, I now have a better understanding of when that was and what was going on. It's not a deep understanding, it's very cursory, uh, but still it's helpful. So um, I'm really glad that I read these books in the order that I read them. So let me talk about Irving Finkel, um, who is a very fun intellectual. Uh, if you ever see him on the YouTube videos, he works for the British Museum. He's an expert in cuneiform uh, and he's translated tons of stuff. Uh, and he's a lot of fun to watch on YouTube. Um, he's he looks like he could he looks like he could be in Hogwarts really. And with a name like Irving Finkel, I feel like that's very um, you know <laughs> the Hogwarts scene as well. He's got like long gray hair, big beard. Um, you know, I was planning on trimming my beard uh, right around now, uh, not shaving it, but just giving it a trim. And I'm like, you know, what? in uh, honor of Irving Finkel, I'm going to uh, keep my beard long at least for until this video was made. Um, so he he is exploring the earliest stories that we have um, in ghost belief, and in some ways he's he's almost using this as a uh, a way to rehabilitate ghost belief in the modern era. Um, he I think he th he's very fond of ghost belief. Uh, he doesn't like the people who have a very purely scientific view of matters on this and say, well, there's no evidence, you know. Um, whoever believes in ghosts must be either delusional, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and he he makes a comparison between like those who believe in ghosts, those who don't believe in ghosts, and those who are agnostic about it. Um, and of course, I think he's you know um, he's rooting for the agnostics, um, but I think he likes the romance of the believers. Um, but he doesn't he doesn't like the people who say ghosts don't exist, which is kind of interesting. Um, even though I think he, he says he doesn't necessarily believe in ghosts, but I think he really likes to believe in ghosts. And I can kind of agree with that. Um, I don't think that he's entirely fair in the way that he is describing those three categories. I am somebody who does not believe in ghosts, but I love ghost stories. And I certainly do believe that the stories we tell about ghosts are valuable um, and they can be interesting and fun. So one of the reasons I'm reading this book here. Um, so anyhow, that aside, um, what he does is he goes through uh, the, you know, the life of these of these ancients um, and how they really thought that ghosts were around them all the time. And it kind of makes sense in some ways, especially because they didn't really have cemeteries. So when a loved one would die, they would bury them right underneath the floor. Or if a baby died, they would bury them right inside the wall or they put them by the wall of the house, uh, you know, with the corpses, which meant that your dead were all around you. Um, and because in this book, I think she mentions that, you know, a house can only last a few you know, because it's made of mud, <laughs> a mud brick. They can only last a few generations where you basically have to rebuild them. So that means when you're tearing down the house to rebuild it, you're basically exposing all these bodies, uh, which is not something that he gets into, but that's, again, why I found this valuable. Um, and, you know, if you needed to access body parts, uh, like for a skull, for a necromancy ritual, which he gets into, you could open up the floor and you can get it. Um, if you want to talk to that loved one and try and communicate with them. So they thought that ghosts were around them all the time. And you had household ghosts and family ghosts. They were always there. But you didn't necessarily want to see ghosts. So if you saw a ghost, that meant that there was a bad omen and that something had to be done. And the whole, especially first half of the book, is about that sort of thing, about, um, you know, seeing the ghosts and what do you do when you see a ghost. And one of my favorite parts of this whole thing uh, was a, an exorcism ritual that I just thought was absolutely hilarious. Uh, I mean, I, you know, I don't want to be crass or, or dismissive. Um, it was just so entertaining. And uh, I am someone who's also a horror fan. Um, so I would just, I was trying to imagine like making a movie about this sort of ritual. Um, so essentially, uh, just as a, give a Cliff Notes version here. Um, if you have an unwanted spirit inside your house. So what the man in the house would do, uh, he would essentially hide his wife away. Um, so the ghost wouldn't see it. And then he would make a an effigy of his wife um, that would look like, look like a, a scarecrow. Um, and they even show on the cuneiform tablets, or no, this isn't the cuneiform tablet, but um, here's a reconstruction. You can kind of see it there. So you make like this, uh, a wife out of reeds, and you make sure to draw like a mouth and a vulva as well. Uh, and while the wife is hidden away, the man would basically treat that effigy as his wife. There would be a script, basically, that he would follow. He would offer it food. He would sleep next to it at night. He would treat it like his wife as much as possible so that the ghost would be tricked. Um, so I don't know. He doesn't... Irving Finkel doesn't really get into it. And of course, maybe we just don't know. Um, all the information that he has on ghosts is purely from 
tablets and cuneiform especially. So it's all written sources. We don't have much at all um, otherwise. Uh, but um, it's like ghosts were either semi-intelligent or maybe because they thought that something that was created here could be used by ghosts, that an effigy would somehow maybe become real for the ghost. I don't know exactly what it is. But I, apparently after a few days, this ghost would be convinced. Um, and then the uh, husband would basically give the effigy to the ghost and say, you know, I I hereby, um, you know, marry th the ghost to this um, to this wife <laughs> that I have here. Um, she is now yours. Go crazy with her, you know, uh, have a, an excellent honeymoon. And then you move that effigy out of the house and apparently the ghost will follow. It's just a very weird ritual. And I'm thinking, you know, it, uh, think of an exorcist film um, <laughs> that could have used something like that. Um, but it does show, you know, uh, the the belief, the practice, um, how much it was just a part of their domestic life that these ghosts would be around. Um, the second half of the book, Finkel does get more into, what was you going to say, mythology. Um, it goes away from ghosts, per se, and tries to look at a couple of tablets in particular and figure out what Babylonians thought about the afterlife. Uh, who could go there? Could they come back? Um, and if so, how? Uh, and that section, it does, there's some inter, it is still interesting, but it does feel like we're taking very long detours to try and get back to ghosts again. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think that that section maybe isn't quite as interesting as the ghost stuff. Um, but then he does get back into things like the necromancy, which I thought was quite interesting. And he ends with a look at, um, the Hebrew Bible. And um, looking at especially the Witch of Endor um, and how that has been interpreted um, when he's saying it, it's been interpreted wrong, uh, that she's not really a witch, that she is a necromancer um, and one that would have been very, very common back then. Um, and, you know, that the ancient uh, Jews obviously believed in very similar thing um, since she is sought out. Um, but he thinks that what she is doing is essentially what the Babylonians did in their necromancy, um, in conjuring spirits back up, uh, and it wasn't necessarily seen as something demonic or evil or anything like that. So it was just a really interesting look um, at the uh, the ancient Hebrew world and uh, how it was influenced by the Babylonians. Um, but yeah, this was a fun book overall. I really enjoyed it. Uh, Definitely one that I'll kind of pick up again at some point, read at least sections of. Um, there's also, he, he does have a whole section about um, Gilgamesh and Enkidu and uh, what that says about the afterlife. And I actually really like that chapter quite a bit. Uh, Gilgamesh is just this, you know, I'd say he's like our oldest hero, uh, <laughs> fictional hero that we have. Um, but he's just kind of interesting. Like, even though he's, he's one of those heroes that um, even though he's thousands of years, I think there's something very relatable about him. Um, to the modern person that a lot of other ancient stories um, are about ancient figures or ancient heroes just in a way that they're not. Uh, so I always get a kick out of reading Gilgamesh. So yeah, these are the two that I read for um, looking at the ancient Near East, the Babylonians. Uh, and, you know, again, this uh, was okay at first, but I valued it a lot more once I read this. And this was just a lot of fun. I really enjoyed it quite a bit. The other thing that I read, I'm going to talk about this one pretty quickly, uh, was this. This is a graphic novel, and it is actually volume two. Uh, I don't have volume one. I have not read volume one. Um, but it is of Sapiens, uh, which was a book that came out a few years ago uh, that it seems to have very mixed opinions on. Um, I had seen a video from Grammaticus Books um, like about a month or so ago, when he talked about his worst books of 2023, and the original Sapiens book was actually on that, and he didn't like it. So I was really curious what I would think about this, and I have to say, I'm this is something I'm kind of lukewarm on. Um, I'm not entirely sure exactly who the audience is for it. I assume it's for younger people, but it has a tendency to uh, drone on at times. Like it takes its time, uh, almost too long to get to certain points. Um, we do have some ancient history in here, but it's not as much as I would like. Instead, it seems like a lot of almost like pet theories from Harari, the, the author. Uh, and he's in this, and he kind of depicts himself as this almost like celebrity intellectual iconoclast that uh, 
you know, the, the, the system, they, they can't stand how he's, you know, exposing the truth almost. And that's kind of, you know, uh, that, that's a little bit cringy, I think. Um, we have the first section talks about the agricultural revolution, and he's very negative on the agricultural revolution. Uh, basically, all of our problems seem to have come from that. And in contrast, it depicts hunter-gatherers uh, in a way that just seems very, um, very rose-colored glasses. Uh, if this book is to be believed, hunter-gatherers lived in a perfectly egalitarian society. Um, they never really were without food, and they spent most of their day just kind of kicking around and, and relaxing and living a life of leisure. Uh, really hard to believe, I gotta say. I'm sure there are moments like that, but um, and in contrast, the agricultural revolution is seen as just basically destroying humanity. Uh, <laughs> so I'm very iffy on that one. He does talk about things like, what does he call it, um, imagined... Imagine Fictions, I think it is, or something like that. Uh, which, in some ways, the way he describes it just seems like another word for culture. But essentially, it's lies that we all agree to believe in um, so that society can function, so society uh, can continue. And in some ways, I think that he's absolutely right on that. I don't have a problem with it. But some of the examples that he gives, I just don't quite understand. Like, he said that taking vacations is really just a result of imagined fictions. Um, that the reason we do it is because we believe in something called experiences. And he goes in this whole thing. And I'm like, you know, I love history. Sometimes I just want to go and see the history stuff. Like, it's, <laughs> it doesn't have to be this big imagined thing. Uh, so some of the examples that are given, I am not really impressed with. And um, I have to say, you know, he's... What, this does occasionally touch on American history. And it it can leave a lot to be desired. Uh, there is a passage in here that talks about, um, it's just like one box, but it tries to explain very quickly like what the Civil War was like, or at least like the election of 1860. And it doesn't do a very good job of it. Um, I'm just actually just flipping through really quickly to, just to see if I can quickly come across it. Uh, but there was a lot wrong with the way that they uh, describe American history. Um, I think I'm about to give it. Oh, no, here it is. So it's this. This box right here. It says, When in 1860, a majority of American voters concluded that African slaves were human beings and should have a right to liberty, it took a, a bloody civil war to make the southern states agree to this. Like, there's so much, there's so much wrong with that, historically. Uh, a majority of American voters did not vote that slaves should have liberty in the 1860s. That's not what happened. <laughs> um, yes, Lincoln was elected. He was not elected by more than half the population. Uh, the South split the ticket too much. Um, just none of them got as many votes as Lincoln. Lincoln was not running as abolitionist. He didn't want slavery spread to the West. Um, he didn't like slavery, but that's not what his platform was. His platform was not to end slavery. Uh, it was not to have it spread. So, and we touch on things like the Founding Fathers in here as well, and their, his depiction of Jefferson is very not like what Jefferson was like. Uh, talks about um, the, uh, the, the fictions of the Declaration of Independence and how America is basically founded on myths um, like equality. And of course it goes into, you know, the, the um, hip hypocrisy of, uh, of the equality and um, the fact that many of these men were slaveholders. Uh, but it totally disregards the Constitution. Uh, which came later, and which is the the true founding document. Um, you know, you can kind of see the Declaration of Independence as maybe like the uh, Declaration of Independence as maybe like a birth certificate, but it's really the Constitution. And you know, he basically takes a lot of exception with um, God given rights in the Declaration of Independence. The Constitution intentionally doesn't mention God. So, it's the examples that are being used for American history. I definitely were not that impressed with. Um, so this is not something that I can really, really recommend. Um, I thought it was okay. Uh, like I said, it's it takes its time getting to some things. Some things it kind of shows as being profound, which just seem like readily accepted common sense. Um, so this was overall a disappointment for me. I didn't hate it. There were certainly some things I liked in it. Um, but overall, I just, you know, out of the three, this was definitely uh, coming in third, a distant third place. So, the three things that I read for the beginning <laughs> of January, the beginning of Historathon 2024, quarter one. We've got 
not in the proper order. Uh, the first ghosts, we've got the Babylonians, and Introduction, and Sapiens. So let's make my little pyramid here. All right, if you've read any of these, love to hear your thoughts. And as always, thank you, BookTube.